a near-death experience, just by definition, is a memory or a collection of memories that occur at a time when our body is in grave physical danger. It is the first Saturday in April, and as she does at the beginning of every month, social worker mother and near-death expert Kimberly Clark Sharp is convening a meeting of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. The Seattle group, with more than a thousand followers, has been meeting for 13 years, making it the oldest and biggest of the country's 30 chapters. I wouldn't do this for Kimberly Clark Sharp is one of an estimated 12 million Americans who have had a near-death experience. She collapsed without warning outside a building in Shawnee Mission, Kansas, 24 years ago, and was without a pulse for several minutes before she was resuscitated. No one ever determined why she collapsed, but in the gap, she says she met her creator in the midst of an explosion of light. Which is entirely made up of love. There is nothing else to its being but love. And it's brighter than any sun. The yearning to be with this light is overwhelming. It's all that matters. My near-death experience was more real than this interview. This reality is shadow play compared to what I experienced. This is not as real. So was it real? No, it was more real. Besides seeing an indescribable light, researchers have identified other characteristics of the near-death experience collected from people all over the world. They include a sense of flying through a dark tunnel, floating outside of one's own body, encounters with deceased relatives, being accompanied by, by a guide or angel, a review of one's entire life, a sense of complete peace, and a choice to return to life on Earth. Stories of life after death are conveyed in literature and art going back thousands of years. The belief is the foundation of many of the world's religions. But why the explosion of individual near-death stories in the last two decades? Because in the last 20 years, new resuscitation techniques have been developed, which quite literally are bringing people back to life who never would have survived before. And often when they return, they claim to have, have new knowledge about life on this planet. I learned that, in a sense, we're in school. We're here to learn how to love others. The goal is unconditional love, which is a very tall order. The more people examine the near-death experience and their own mortality, the more likely they are to appreciate life and to grasp that it's about loving others. A life well-lived is a life well-loved. Now is the time to put that into place. Now, now is the time to let people that you love know that you love them. Now is the time to say thank you. That's why we're here? Mm -hmm. That's what you learned? In part. It's enough. In Seattle, I'm Julie Blacklow, Cairo News, Channel 7. Dr. Melvin Morse is internationally renowned for his research on the near-death experience, especially his work with children. No Hi, matter, boy. like many other husbands, he too Hi, has to pick boy. up the kids from daycare, bring home dinner, and remember to bring home some of his work as well. Somewhere in his hectic life, filled with his own kids, pediatric practices in Renton and Seattle, and writing two bestsellers on near-death, Melvin Morse has found time to study this for 15 years. The near-death experience not only uh, poses uh, spiritual challenges for all of us, but it uh, really is a gateway to a new understanding of how the human mind works. Morse is one of a handful of medical doctors who believe that just as speech, sight, and memory are controlled within our brains, so too is our spirituality, our access to that other realm visited by those who've had near-death experiences. This whole segment and section of brain right in here. The deepest part. The deepest part and then connecting to this almost near our brain stem right here. Mm -hmm. Where our hippocampus and our very deep right temporal lobe structures are what we call the circuit boards of mysticism. Are areas in the brain which allow us to communicate and perceive God. Moore cites the work of British neurosurgeon Wilder Penfield, 
who, 50 years ago, was the first person to probe the human brain and begin to map out its different functions. Penfield was able to replicate some aspects of the near-death experience, such as the sense of leaving one's body and encountering deceased relatives by probing the right temporal lobe area. Morse continued his own scientific research into the near-death experience, focusing on children, and discovered that the presence of drugs or anesthesia alone did not cause a near-death experience. The key factor was the proximity to death, how critically close to dying the children were. It's certainly very reasonable to assume that the near-death experience is nothing more than a reactive fantasy to the stresses of nearly dying. In fact, I believe that's what most medical doctors and scientists think. In fact, that's what I thought when I started studying these experiences. The only problem with that theory, which certainly makes sense, is that it just doesn't pan out. The data doesn't support it. In fact, all of the scientific data in the last 10 years supports the notion that near-death experiences are the best objective evidence of what it's like to die. That they are not related to drugs, they are not related to a lack of oxygen to the brain, but they are somehow intricately enmeshed in the process of dying itself. When people ask me, is the near-death experience real, it's as real as any other human emotion and feeling. It's as real as love. It's as real as math. It's certainly as real as language. It's as real as the calculus, which is responsible for us sending uh, men to the moon. Uh, so certainly near-death experiences are real. It's not some sort of spasm of our optic nerve. It's a light that most children who see it say is God. In Seattle, I'm Julie Blacklow, Cairo News, Channel 7. Near-death experiences are a cultural icebreaker. People want to know what happens when we, we die. Like most humans, Dr. Melvin Morse wanted to know that. This local pediatrician, a specialist in emergency medicine, never learned about death in medical school. But a dozen years ago, he began to get some answers from children whom he and other doctors helped to resuscitate. In the early 80s, Mel Morse began asking children to draw pictures of a beautiful place they had seen. This is, uh, this is a young girl that nearly died of bacterial meningitis. Um, she's, she's floated out of her body, and then this is Jesus, and he's very nice. Children have just wonderfully beautiful, simple experiences. Uh, here's a typical child's experience. These experiences clearly are real. These experiences should be respected. And he began keeping his own video records of interviews with young people from all over the country. Chris Davis fell into a dirt tunnel four years ago, went outside his body and said he met God. You thought you were one of the chosen ones. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't have a Not everyone sees God. When they're close to Chris's mother says he seems more mature now and very little upsets him. The typical child who we then interview as a teenager or an adult who has this experience will say, I don't mind waiting in line at the supermarket anymore. I know that's an important part of life. Another of the several hundred children Mel Morse has interviewed is 15-year-old Chris, who nearly died of a bronchial infection and saw her grandparents in a, in a great white light. And she was telling me that it's your choice to make. No one can make that choice. And if you want to stay here with us, you're welcome. If you want to go back, there are others calling and waiting for you to go back. You're welcome to go back, but make your choice. It's up to you. Morse believes that the fact that children, some of whom are just toddlers, are having these experiences is as close to proof of life after death as spiritual proof gets. They just, they're so matter-of-fact about it. Um, they're just, the, you know, they're obviously, they have no secondary gain. You know, they're not going to be on a talk show. They're not going to write a best-selling book about it. Uh, they have no reason to invent the story. Um, they just, they just, if anything, they have reason to not tell the story because uh, they think that they'll be laughed at. They, uh, they think they're crazy. When, when you've had a child condescendingly pat you on the hand and say, you'll see, Dr. Morse, heaven is fun, you know, like I have, 
uh, you tend to pay a lot more attention to these experiences. But I see our society as having a deep uh, spiritual craving for this kind of information. Every time I interview uh, someone, it gets, just gives me chills. I go, it must be true. It what? must be true that something happens to us after we die. And that knowledge has changed the way I live. And I, I would hope it's made me, you know, a, a more loving person. I'm Julie Blacklow, Cairo News, Channel 7.